So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this rainy morning to our first ever webinar on using digital images in surgical site surveillance. My name is Melissa Roshan, and I'm the Quality Safety Lead for Surveillance at the Royal Brompton and Harefield Trust. I'd like to welcome, welcome you on behalf of the Cardiac SSI Network to our first ever webinar. The network was established about seven years ago and we've had some fantastic colleagues working in adult and pediatric cardiac surgery, sharing ideas, innovation, and collaborating on projects and publications. Our network operates on a rotating chair basis, and this time it seems to be my turn. We're delighted to have some excellent speakers for this morning's sessions. Given the growing interest in using digital images to help virtual wound reviews due to COVID-19, as well as increasing trends to take pictures of surgical wounds generally, we thought it would be useful to have a look at findings from high quality research studies to help inform our practice in this area. We also have a terrific session on using machine learning to improve the utility of images from Isla Care, and I hope after the next couple of hours that you'll come away with some new ideas for your area or reassurance that you're not alone. Throughout the morning, I'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat feature to post your questions or comments. We'll be reviewing these at the 10.35 session with a short break before resuming at 11. So to begin and by way of background, we know that SSI are an important quality indicator to patients, clinicians and policy makers. In the UK, the cost of managing SSI is estimated at just over £1 billion per annum, and the complication accounts for approximately 30% of surgical sepsis. Some of the signs and symptoms of SSI for surveillance purposes include permanent discharge, culture likely of the causative pathogen, and new or increasing inflammation. Wound gaping or opening on its own, normal discoloration associated with healing and a stitch abscess would not be recorded as an SSI using the national protocol. It's clear that digital wound images would not capture all of these criteria, but I think we would agree we wouldn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Prospective surveillance is extremely labour intensive and often includes reviewing lots of nursing and medical notes. This is an example of what I'd need to review to determine whether or not to query an SSI. And just scanning through, I can see no signs of infection noted quite regularly in the written wound assessment. But add a digital image taken on the first day, and it's clear that this is actually quite a serious SSI. Infection presenting at the proximal or upper end of the stenotomy is at higher risk of sinus formation and mediastinitis, as there are fewer anatomical layers involved. In this case, I'm getting better information and faster from reviewing a digital image. And I think there are some other benefits as well. SSI prevention is understood to be a combination of infection prevention practices and exacting surgical technique. I'd like to highlight the work of the Bluebell Study Group, who looked at the surgical images taken in theatre. Last year, the Bristol Group published on how inadequate closure of primary surgical wounds may increase the likelihood of SSI through several mechanisms. The presence of gaps in the wound may lead to contamination. Excess suture material may act as anitis for bacterial colonization, and tension may reduce the flow and oxygen delivery, leading to poor wound healing. And I know from our experience of using digital images in our hospital SSI surveillance, that these have provided some great learning opportunities, and in some cases help to inform root cause analysis. For instance, the first image shows diathermy injury distally, which we know would make the wound more vulnerable to bacterial ingress. The second shows surgical clips, which need to be placed equidistant to support wound healing, and the wound did in fact break down in this area after the staples were removed. The third image may highlight potential issues with tissue handling, and in the fourth picture, there may be some issues with margin approximate 
approximation. And finally, in the last image on the right, we can see evidence of suture material. So it's worth noting there can be some useful information in digital images for surveillance purposes beyond the binary SSI outcome. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this from these morning, this morning's speakers. I look forward to learning more about their experience and findings. Session one will cover using photographs to diagnose SSI. Session two looks at the development and evaluation of a method for obtaining patient-generated images for remote SSI assessment. The third session covers different remote follow-up methods used in European and global randomized trials. Following on from this, there will be a Q&A session or comfort break. And then coming back at 11, we'll hear more about wound image outcome data from an RCT. Session five's title is, Can Smartphone Delivered Tool Facilitate the Assessment of SSI and Result in Earlier Diagnosis? And we'll be finishing the morning with a session on AI for enhanced image quality. And finally, just another quick reminder, please post your questions or comments via the chat icon. And we'll try to cover as many as, many as we can at the half past break. I'll now hand over to the first speaker, Mr. Josh Toddy. Thank you, Josh. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Josh. I'm a registrar in plastic surgery uh, in Hull, and in a former life, I was a research fellow in vascular surgery. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about the work that we did looking at surgical site infection um, and how we uh, began to use photographs to facilitate diagnosis of infection in one of our research trials. Um, I'm sure you'll hear this quite a lot today, but um, surgical site infection are amongst the most common healthcare infections. They were the second most common in the UK. Um, in previous studies, they are one of the most expensive hospital acquired infections in terms of the use of resources. Um, and rates vary depending on what procedure patients undergo. Um, but in vascular surgery, which is the cohort that we were looking at, uh, rates can be as high as 15 to 20%. Um, I worked on a, a pilot feasibility randomized control trial called the dressing study. And we looked at novel dressing technologies for reducing primary surgical site infection. Uh, in vascular surgery and that was undertaken between 2017 and 2019 um, and that initial study uh, was a study of 144 patients randomized to two arms um, and this is the study flow chart from that study and what's important to look at here is twofold so first of all these were the patients who weren't able to take part in the study in the first place. And 34 of them said that they couldn't come back to follow up when we explained what the study would entail. Um, sorry, 34 said that it was too far to come back and another six said that for other reasons, they just wouldn't be able to come back. And then when we went through the study, we found that although um, 144 patients were randomized within the study, uh, we had about 23% of patients who didn't complete the study as per the protocol. And when we dived into that, there were a number of reasons, but um, what we found is that there were a number of barriers to them coming back to follow up. So there was the distance involved. There was the problems with the patients that we did operations on and the operations that we did. Um, and aside from getting patients back to see them in clinic, what we found is that what was available at the time was unreliable in diagnosing infection. Um, so to illustrate those points, this is the area that we cover where I work. So Hull is in the center. Um, and although it's 30 miles north to Bridlington, which is the top end of our area, it's two hours by bus if you're asking patients who can't drive to come. And then on the south bank, um, it's again, it's 30 miles to Grimsby, but it's two hours, 25 minutes to get here on a bus. So you're asking patients to make a four or five hour round trip um, to take part in a research trial, which is one of the reasons we found a lot of patients either didn't enter the trial or weren't able to complete the trial. 
And then the second reason is that is vascular surgery itself. On the left, you've got an image of what you might consider a normal wound post-op uh, vascular bypass operation. And as you can see, there's quite a big morbidity involved in that. And on the right is uh, what might be considered a, a normal vascular path in that he's a bilateral amputee and still smoking, wheelchair bound. His mobility will be poor. His access to uh, transport will be limited. Um, and overall getting into and out of hospital for additional research visits was always going to be difficult. So as a sub-study of the study that we undertook, we looked, I wanted to look at whether we could reduce the burden to patients uh, by using some form of telemedical follow-up. Would they find it acceptable and would it ultimately be reliable in delivering the results that we needed? So we took a, a two-part um, study the first was a patient focus group and the second was a clinical validation study. And for those who like to read the end of the book before the start, you can st scan the QR code in the corner and that'll take you to the final published results from this study. So the first aspect was a patient focus group, which was two seconds at, at two sessions of an hour and a half each. They were semi-structured, but recorded verbatim um, and transcribed. Uh, and then a thematic analysis undertaken and we discussed a lot of different things, but we discussed follow-up, um, telephone, photograph follow-up, um, and the impact of surgical site infection on patients. And then the clinical arm of the study, uh, patients who came into the dressing study, they attended a follow-up, um, and then they had a two-factor uh, review. They were viewed in person by a blinded research nurse, and they also had a photograph taken of their wound, and those photographs were sub-analyzed by two reviewers who were separate to the study nurses who were also blind um, to the uh, dressing allocation as part of the main trial. And then all three of those scores were assessed for correlation. We invited nine people to take part in the focus group and only three were able, again, um, largely due to the fact that these were patients who were vascular paths and had infections in the past and getting excuse me, to hospital for, for additional visits was difficult. We were able to incentivize it so that some did come back. The mean age of patients was 70 and they all had experience of surgery, infection and participating in research. And like I say, we covered a lot of topics, but picking out pertinent points, we asked them whether they would feel comfortable with sending a photo of their wound to a research doctor or a nurse. And they said that it wouldn't bother them. They said that if you took a photograph of their leg, it could be anyone's leg and they weren't that concerned about their privacy. And again, they said, if it doesn't, if they're not identifiable by their image, then it didn't really matter to them. And they understood the reasons for it being taken. And then given the age and the demographic of the patients that we were uh, discussing this with, we asked whether they would feel technically savvy enough to do that. And we got a varied response. Some said, of course, I'd be able to do that. I do that all the time. I take pictures of the garden or the grandchildren or, or et cetera, et cetera, and send it to family members. Another said, well, I might find it difficult, but I know people who will be able to help. So that didn't seem an issue for them either. So then we looked at the photographs that we'd taken and whether they, they would be reliable for diagnosing infection. Um, the surgeries that were undertaken varied and we had a total of 53 anonymous photographs from 37 patients. We asked two independent reviewers to score the wound based on the um, diagnostic criteria that we were using in the trial at the time. So we asked them to look for whether there was exudate, whether there was redness, whether there was pus and whether the wound had broken open. And then as a final point, we asked if you were given this photograph in a clinical context, would you want this patient to come back and see you in a clinical setting? And what we found is that reliability uh, was generally pretty good. So for exudate, pus and wound edge separation, there was a more than 85% agreement across all reviewers. Erythema was slightly less agreeable, but there was still more than 60% agreement. 
correlation coefficients for the absolute agreement, so the total score, was excellent. And when we asked, would you want to see this patient in person, the clinical photograph reviewers, again, correlated excellently. This obviously wasn't without its limitations. Um, as I showed you, the uh, erythema, whether the photograph reviews felt that wounds were red, differed between the photographs and the clinical reviewers. And we wondered whether that was a difference in how colours were portrayed on screen, um, whether there was a problem with the white balance in photographs, or whether actually erythema is overdiagnosed when seen in person. It was a small study, there were only 57 images, and all of the photos in this study were taken by clinicians, with a clinician's eye and knowing what clinicians would look for. Um, we would anticipate that there would be a difference in the calibre and quality of photographs that were coming from patients. And that was something that we weren't able to explore as part of this study, but we would look to explore in future studies. And this was undertaken as part of a clinical trial, and there would be quite a leap, but not, a, not an unachievable leap, in incorporating this into routine clinical practice. And I know that some of the speakers later on have begun to incorporate this into routine clinical practice. So in summary, we found from our small study that patients may find telemedical assessment acceptable and they'd be willing to engage with it. That largely it was reliable, but there were definitely opportunities for further work into how we apply this in both research settings and clinical settings and how we expand it so that we are outside of a research capacity um, and being able to bring this into large multi-centered multinational research studies and into routine clinical practice. Um, thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you, Josh. That was a great presentation. And I think there's some really interesting points to think about. I know you've been struggling with laryngitis over the last week, but that was that was great. So I'm now pleased to welcome Rhiannon as our next speaker. Rhiannon is a research fellow at the University of Bristol. Thank you, Melissa. I'll just get my slides uploaded and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so, yeah, as Melissa said, my name is Rhiannon Macefield. I'm a research fellow from the University of Bristol and I work within the Centre for Surgical Research. And I'm going to talk to you about a study called Self-Taken Images of Surgical Wounds, um, which was looking at the development and the evaluation of a method for obtaining patient-generated images for um, remotely assessing SSI. And I just want to share with you what we learned from doing this study. There was lots of input from patients themselves. So I'm going to share what we learned and share the findings. So my background is in trials and particularly in assessing outcomes in trials. And in surgical trials, where we're evaluating different surgical interventions or um, a new surgical innovation, often you want to measure SSI as an outcome. It's a really important outcome. But I'm sure you're all aware that accurate assessment and it is really challenging. And mainly this is because many of the problems occur after the patient has, has left hospital. And Josh just really nicely set the scene there just to show that in trials it's often a real problem, a real challenge to get patients back for a face-to-face -face assessment of their wound. So we really need some good methods, some robust methods for potentially doing remote wound assessment. And I know this problem is not limited to trials, obviously it's an issue across surveillance and of course in um, routine follow-up as well, routine clinical care. 
So we started to explore the use of wound images and how these might be a useful method or a useful um, supplement for other data. So it's important to say that the wound images weren't considered to be used standalone. So they would be supplementary to other information that potentially the patient could report on symptoms and so on. And the value of images, of course, nowadays is that many of them, they're digital, they can be collected digitally and transmitted electronically. So ideal um, for remote assessment. And with all the brilliant advances and things we've got now in technology, the patient can potentially be the provider of these images remotely because all the different amazing mobile devices we've got now, smartphones and um, tablet computers and so on, have these really fantastic good quality cameras. So we set up the selfie wound study. Now selfie was an acronym for um, self taken images of surgical wounds. And I'm gonna come back to that title later because it did have some quite significant findings. But the aim of the study was to explore the feasibility of a method for collecting self taken or carer taken images of primary surgical wounds after the patient has left hospital. So really to explore whether such a method was acceptable to patients, were they willing and able to do it? Was it feasible? Um, and importantly, was it efficient and effective to produce an image that was standardised, clear and exactly what we would need to use in a trial to potentially assess um, wound infection? So the study had two phases, really. Phase A, um, focused on developing the method and that was constructed out, the method itself was twofold. So first of all, um, we developed some wound photography instructions for patients. So these were detailed instructions for patients to follow themselves at home, telling them or asking them step by step how to go through the process of photographing their wound. And these were drafted initially from existing guidance that we've got for professional photographers. So particularly um, healthcare professionals taking wound images um, and me medical illustrators and so on. So I looked at the guidance, particularly from the Institute of Medical Illustrators, which has all the key features that you really need for a good quality image. So things like lighting, framing, all of those really important aspects to the photograph that you'd need to consider. I also looked at um, trials that had used wound photographs where healthcare professionals had taken the image and I looked at what was written in those protocols for healthcare professionals and adapted this into, into some draft instructions for patients. The second part of the method, if you like, was to um, develop a system that patients could then transmit the images. And I looked at existing software, I looked at REDCap. So um, this is a electronic data capture software, which is an online survey and it's already widely used. Um, it's really easy to use. It covers all the kind of security um, and governance issues. And it also has a feature where you can upload an image. So it ticked all the boxes for um, what we would require in this kind of trial setting. And um, particularly advantageous is it's suitable for use with mobile devices. So it's, it's easy to navigate on your smartphone or on your tablet. So having drafted the instructions and kind of set up this in initial process using WebCamp, I then undertook um, some pre-testing. Yeah, fantastic. And um, pre-testing is done with patients. Face to face interviews um, after they had had yeah. surgery in hospital. I went to the patient's homes and showed them the draft instructions, went through, um, sat with them while, while they attempted to, to follow the instructions and take a picture of their wound using their own device. And we, we I observed them as they were doing it. We discussed um, what was working, what was confusing, how things could be improved. And this was the real, the collaborative work. So patients were really inputting into this phase of the study. And the 16 patients that took part were a broad range of ages and um, intentionally um, sampled. 
as well to have a broad range of kind of savviness, as Josh called it, and experience with technology. So from, the, from this pre-testing um, phase, encouragingly, patients were really keen and supportive of providing their own images. And this reflects, again, what we've just heard from Josh. There were a few topics raised. Um, they weren't necessarily relevant to the people that I spoke to, but it's certainly something that they raised as maybe applicable to others going forward, especially the issue of squeamishness. So it might be that people aren't willing to take a picture of their own, own wound for, for these kind of reasons. And also, interestingly, as I mentioned, um, the use of the word selfie. So we started to talk about these self-taken images as wound selfies thinking that it was a quite a kind of catchy um, word and, and people would engage with taking part in the study because of that reason. But on, on, the, on the contrary, some of the participants I spoke to pre-testing actually found um, the use of the word wound selfie not very appropriate. It's got um, associations with taking pictures of yourself, particularly for social media. And some of the people that I spoke to thought that this wasn't really applicable to, to apply to a kind of... Um, a clinical context. So this is again a learning point to, to share with everybody that actually is um, it, to, to think about how, if you want people to engage with doing something like this, really to think about the kind of language and the words that you're using, not one size fits all. Um, doing the pre-testing also highlighted some key things. I learned so much about mobile devices I had no I idea would potentially be an issue. So different models and different makes have variations in terms of whether the front facing cameras are and whether you can take a um, an image with a flash using the front facing camera all these little quirky things that you have to really think about when you're um, wanting people to do this using their own devices not surprisingly dressings came up as a, a potential potential challenge so depending on the, the time point that you're asking patients to take an image this is certainly something that needs to be addressed um, people would with dressings in place would have concerns potentially about removing that dressing and want, not wanting to do that or in fact not it's not recommended that they should do that because of the risk of introducing infection or the worry that this might um, interfere with their wound healing. But importantly and brilliantly the pre-testing and the participants involved gave so many valuable suggestions to improve the wording of these instructions to, to get them really clear and um, something that the general public and people who are not familiar with taking photographs or even using their own devices could easily follow and ultimately to, to, to end with the product of a, um, a really nicely framed, clear picture of the wound uh, that's standardised and something that you could use then going forward um, for assessment. So the instructions were refined and the process for transmitting images were refined to as good as we hoped they could get. So the second phase of the study was to do a remote pilot. So rather than me sitting with people while they were taking their wound pictures was to actually roll it out to on a, on a wider scale and to see what pictures um, came back and also to do a bigger survey on how people found the whole process. So patients were recruited after having surgery in hospital, these were abdominal and vascular surgery patients uh, that we were focusing on in this study. After they left hospital, then um, I posted them the photography on instructions. And again, this is a learning point that we found if people were going to be using their devices to take the image, they would prefer to have a physical copy of the instructions so that they could read this instructions as they um, did the the photograph rather than having an electronic version of the instructions on the same device where they would have to keep, keep um, flicking backwards and forwards. So the physical copy of the instructions were posted and this was timed with an email with a link to then submit their images using the REDCap online survey um, software. And it included in this survey was um, after the image upload were some brief questions asking about how they found the whole process and whether they had any particular feedback. So if I didn't hear back from any, anybody, I had um, some 
reminders set up, so either a phone call or an email reminder, depending on what their preference was at the time of recruitment, to kind of give them a gentle nudge to take their image and submit their image. And then a smaller sample, I just I also um, built in some more lengthy follow-up phone calls to um, hear a bit more about how they um, how they went with the process and to get any other feedback as well. So we recruited 91 patients after having surgery and 89 of these were sent the instructions. The two that dropped out, one, one had a prolonged hospital stay, unfortunately, and the other one didn't provide contact details. Um, but of those 89, 46 took an image and uploaded them via the REDCap system. So we received images from just over half of our sample. 61% um, of those, so 28 of the 46, did, did the whole process without the need for a reminder. But the major majority of them and the other 40% did need this kind of prompt after five days or, or a week where we hadn't received anything from them. In that box there in the middle, the, the other blue box, you can see that four people did take an image. So I know that they followed the first step, if you like, and they, took, they were able to photograph their wound, but they had issues uploading it using the, the, the software. These are generally uh, technical issues, but I did receive the image from them through uh, an email method. So in total, from the 50 participants that took images, we received 102 photos. 102 um, images. So some participants took more than one photograph. But importantly, again, to share with you this kind of uh, another learning point are the 44% who I've called non-completers. So 39 of those 89 didn't complete the process. And with the follow-up um, phone calls and the feedback, I was able to find out the reasons for some of these. So several of them had further health problems. A few were too, too busy, no longer interested in taking part in the study, but only a few actually had practical or technical issues with, with doing it. And it's important to say that this, the whole study, the selfie wound study, was made aware to patients that it was just a feasibility study to develop and explore the method. The images weren't going to be used as part of the patient's um, clinical follow-up, so patients were fully aware of that. And I'd hope that, that this issue of non-completers might be um, reduced if, if this was actually rolled out as a part of the, um, the patient's care pathway, or indeed if they were actually involved in a trial. There were 22 people that I wasn't able to understand why they hadn't taken an image or sent it. Attempts to contact them either by email or by telephone um, were not successful. So again, that is another limitation that about 25% of this study sample were unsure why they didn't take and submit a photo. So just to give you some brief demographics of those that did, there was about a 60-40 split of um, male and female. Almost all of the participants were white. And again, this is a limitation and something that would certainly need to be explored with further work. So to look at different ethnic groups. Um, about 60% of the participants had had elective surgery and just under 40 had had unplanned. And you can see from that bar chart there, um, there was quite a broad spread of ages. So it wasn't just all the younger ones that were um, taking part and able to take and upload the image. There was a nice spread, in fact, some going up into their 80s as well. And obviously, as a methodologist, I was interested in looking at the people that didn't um, complete. So I did some comparisons between the information that we had on the demographics of those that followed the whole method and uploaded their photo and those that didn't. And I found no differences in, in things like age or um, the type of surgery they'd had or even um, the, um, the time since they'd had their surgery. So there was nothing that I could identify that was potentially significant in terms of why some of these people hadn't completed the process. So as I said, in the, in the REDCap 
survey, after uploading images, we did embed a few questions asking people about how they found the whole process. So um, majority of them did it very quickly with very little issues. 40% took the image themselves. So the rest of them had asked somebody else to help within their household, which was absolutely fine. And, and in the instructions, we actually um, included that to say that it's okay to ask somebody to help take the photograph if it, if it was easier. And most people uploaded the images on their own without any help. Some did need, again, a partner or a family member to help, but they managed to get over those issues um, and, and send the picture without a problem. And so here's a, a couple of uh, snapshots of, of the snapshots of the images that we received. And I was absolutely blown away actually um, by the quality of these pictures that people were taking just using their own devices. They were fantastically clear on the whole, really nicely framed. Um, and you could see that people had clearly followed the instructions and um, were able to take the standardized image as, as, as we'd required and anticipated. So that was brilliant. We had, as I said, 102 images. So we did do a kind of quality assessment in a similar way that Josh had described. We asked um, three clinical assess assessors, so three surgical colleagues to review all the images on a, um, a digital screen independently. So they looked at them themselves um, with me sitting with, with them and they were assessing each one for its suitability potentially for assessing an SSI. So as I said, we weren't actually using these images in real time, but we were asking the clinical assessors to say, if you receive this image, would you find it suitable for potentially assessing um, the wound for infection? And the majority of those images, so 85% were judged as sufficient by at least two of the assessors. Those that were unsufficient were majority, majority of those wounds were um, wounds that had included the belly button. So particularly wounds that were kind of semi-hidden in a body cavity. And this is, a, again, another learning point and a challenge that actually not all wounds would be suitable for assessing via a, a photograph. And there would be some types of wounds that you would actually want to see um, face to face so that you could potentially manipulate the skin to give a, a, a to be confident that you'd assess the wound um, as a whole. So in summary, we've developed a simple method, some instructions and a fairly simple process for um, collecting digital images from patients after they've left the hospital using their own device. It's possible to then obtain a really clear patients can produce using this method a clear standardized image of the wound that's suitable for um, clinical assessment. We found that um, reminders are potentially key. So again, this is something that will need to be um, considered if this method was uh, used going forward to, to build in a good reminder process to make sure that you get as, as good feedback, as good response rates as possible. We've now got these wound photography instructions that have been developed and pre-tested with input and work with patients that are ready for future use. As I said, these patients were own, it's only been tested so far with abdominal surgery and um, patients who've had abdominal surgery or vascular surgery. So this would have to be um, evaluated further with different patient groups have, having undergone different types of surgery where potentially the wounds are in, in different locations as well. And as I've gone through, there were some challenges that would need to be addressed taking this method forward. So again, the issue about dressing use and, and when you're asking patients to, to take an image of their wound and also to try and um, increase the response rates um, to, to, get, to get better, um, a, a higher number of images from as many patients as possible. So our next steps, the future work, future plans are to um, explore these images and using this method as a supplement to a patient reported wound healing questionnaire that we have developed as part of a prior study called the Bluebell Wound Healing Questionnaire, which asks patients to report their signs and symptoms um, for SSI 
and it's hoped that this image could be used as a supplement with the data from the um, Bloom, Bluebell Wound Healing Questionnaire to then be able to be used as a, an all-round method for use in trials um, to assess SSI as an outcome. Assess, as an outcome. And that's it for me, just to acknowledge the study collaborators and also the great work of the surgical research teams to help recruit patients um, and also the funders of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. So similar to Josh's session, lots of important takeaways. I'd like to mention it's great to see your work influencing recommendations in the National Wound Care Strategy Program for using digital images, including the step-by-step -step guidance for patients and carers. For those of you interested in commenting on recommendations for digital images in wound care, I'll provide some extra um, information on this during the webinar wrap-up. So Josh and Rhiannon will be returning to help us answer some questions at the open session during the break. Please could you add your comments or questions by using the chat feature or icon. And also just to mention, this webinar will be recorded. So we're running slightly ahead of schedule, which is no bad thing so that we can make sure that everyone gets a break after the next session. At this point, it's my pleasure now to welcome James Glasby and hear more about his extensive experiences in national and international studies. Thank you for joining us, James. Thank you very much, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, may I have my slides, if that's OK? There was going to be one gremlin, at least. <laughs> Perfect, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so my name's James. I'm an NIHR doctoral research fellow in, in global surgery, which is effectively the application of, of global health and public health principles and um, to the way that surgical care is delivered around the world. And I work in, in Birmingham in the NIHR Global Health Research Unit on global surgery, uh, which is a seven million pound investment in uh, trials units around the world um, in specifically in, in seven different low middle income countries that are set up to conduct and prioritize research which can benefit patients. And so I'm delighted to talk to you today about our experience of remote follow up within several randomized trials, two in low and middle income countries, and uh, one that we're conducting right now um, in, 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 in Europe. Uh, specifically going to talk to you about our experience with live uh, wound videos and some of the foibles around that and some of the benefits that we think it might convey in the future. Um, so as, as we've heard already, uh, you know, SSI is a very common problem as an expensive and fairly disastrous for our patients. What you may not have as much insight into is the way that SSI rates vary around the world. And we published a paper in Lancet Infectious Disease a couple of years ago uh, which demonstrated that if you have your surgery performed in a lower middle income country, then you're much more likely, as much as three times more likely, to suffer a wound infection than in a high income country. And that has very multifactorial reasons, but means that patients around the world suffer SSI even more commonly than we see in the UK. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, we conducted a global prioritization exercise and, and actually, it showed that surgeons and patients and providers all around the world think that SSI is actually the, the key research priority. Uh, it's the thing that affects the patients most commonly, it's most severe, uh, and really we should focus our research efforts on, um, which is we thought was very reaffirming for us as, a, as an SSI research community. So I thought it might be of interest. So I'm gonna to talk to you first about two um, global trials that we're conducting at the moment and, and then what we've been doing to explore remote follow-up methods within it. And the first is the FALCON trial. And, and FALCON is a two by two factorial trial. So it's testing two different interventions with the same outcome of 30 day SSI as defined by the CDC criteria. And the th two things that we are testing are a 2% chlor alcoholic chlorhexidine solution and um, for preparation of the, of the abdomen before major abdominal surgery, elective or emergency versus, you know, your betadine, povidine iodine and an aqueous solution. And also you may have seen the Ethicon um, impregnated sutures with triclosan. And we're looking at comparing use of those sutures for closure of the 
the fascial layer, the tough surface over the, the body cavity um, versus using a standard suture. And we're hoping to find out which combination or which intervention uh, works most effectively at reducing SSI in that population. And uh, we've actually just about finished that study now, very excitingly. Uh, there's not very often we get to present a trial recruitment curve like this, but um, after we managed to get the centre set up in uh, you know, June, July 2019, uh, things really increased exponentially and all credit to our amazing research partners around the world who have set up a, a truly world-class delivery system for, for research like this. So we, we finished about uh, 18 months, 12 months ahead of, um, of schedule in this trial, and we are now having a look at the data um, for the first time, which is really exciting. Uh, as it's such a high priority topic, we're also conducting this trial called CHEETAH, and CHEETAH uses a slightly different methodology. In CHEETAH, it's a cluster randomized trial, so rather than randomizing at a, a patient level, we're randomizing at a hospital level, and we're looking at the practice of change of gloves and instruments at the time of fascial closure when we close that tough abdominal wall. Uh, interestingly, it is not universal practice. Lots of people are surprised to hear that at the end of the operation, people uh, before closing the lovely clean skin and, and flesh below it, then we do not uh, routinely change gloves and instruments. Um, sometimes people will if there's been gross contamination. I know in cardiac surgery, that's probably a little bit more unlikely. Um, but here we are testing that routine practice versus what surgeons are doing uh, wh wherever they are in the world. And that will include 13,000 patients and it's just finished recruiting its first 1,000 patients, excitingly. So I think I just wanted to highlight by sharing those trials and um, that what we have an opportunity for is, is using these trial platforms to conduct studies within trials. And, and these are becoming increasingly recognized and are now part of the HDA funding calls and have their own um, unique funding streams. And there's even a, a study within a trial, a SWOT registry provided by Trial Forge, that are a leading methodology network. And so what we would like to do here is to use these trial platforms um, to conduct really high quality studies, which are um, quality assured and use the efficiency of this network to evaluate remote and digital follow-up methods. And um, so what we start with at the moment, we will all have seen this before, that CDC criteria and where we have to call our patients back to hospital at 30 days. Um, and, and review the wound and, and conduct an assessment with a trained clinician. And I can only stress to you uh, how much of a, of a trouble that is in some of the uh, lower middle income countries that we, we work with. Um, as we've seen, you know, recruitment of these trials, they are so high volume in some centres that, that actually recruiting thousands of patients is not the major challenge um, to these studies, but actually follow up and doing something efficient, which doesn't overbear clinical services and doesn't have negative you know, impacts on patients and, uh, and clinicians is really, really important. And that's where this role of imagery, videos and remote methods is, is so essential. And if I could give you one um, example, um, sorry, I think that was an animation previously, but um, to give you one example, um, this is an area of rural Rwanda where um, we have a really um, excellent uh, leadership group um, that work with 12 hospitals in, in Rwanda. And for some patients, they travel around 12 to 14 hours to get to hospital for their surgery. And after their discharge, they will travel back by um, usually by like motorbike to their rural village community. And actually coming back to hospital at 30 days when they've already risked catastrophic expenditure from their operation, you know, more time away from their family, more time out of work is really a disaster for them. Um, so more efficient, but equally as high quality methods are needed. Uh, and Rwanda was one of the countries that participated in this Lancet infectious disease study that I mentioned earlier. And when we've looked at the data there, we found that if people were followed up remotely over the telephone in an unstandardized fashion, um, we probably look at missing around 20 to 25% of of wound infections. So it's insufficient just to call people and, and run over symptoms. There's something more robust that's required. Um, that is just what I've said. Perfect. So one solution, um, which Rianne on, uh, which Rianne on, uh, led from, um, from Bristol, which she's mentioned already, is this wound healing questionnaire, which is a, 
uh, a questionnaire which has been derived and validated in the UK um, by, the, by the Bristol team at the Blue Bell Study Group, which um, we collaborated with. Um, and it showed that the um, assessment over the telephone, according to this structured patient report and outcome measure, um, was reliable. Um, and it was it was really valid in detecting uh, correctly wound infections with a high um, area under the receiver operator curve. Um, I think a proportion of those were con conducted over the telephone. However, of course, when it comes to uh, talking to patients in low and middle income countries, um, in, in all countries around the world, there's differences, cultural nuances. Patients will um, report and, and, and explain their symptoms in, in different ways. And it's really important that we think about how we can adapt these methods um, for use across very diverse environments. Um, so that's what we've started trying to do. Um, and the study we've called it is Talon. Uh, we have an animal-based theme for our global surgery trials and this fitted nicely with that study within a trial model. Uh, and what this was hoping to look at is the feasibility and diagnostic accuracy of of telephone administration of this patient reported outcome measure. Um, we are early in that process. We have been doing uh, cross-cultural and cross-language adaptation according to validated frameworks and doing some psychometric analysis of that questionnaire as it's delivered over the telephone in different environments. Uh, sadly, due to COVID, we've struggled to talk to as many patients as we'd like to. Uh, we've done lots of um, interviews and uh, and focus groups with, with surgeons and clinicians and research nurses that have been doing the follow-up to learn about their experience and to, to try and uh, look at how these questionnaires may need to be adapted across uh, different languages. And one of the key themes that came across from these discussions, which is of course of interest today, is the fact that many countries around the world already use clinical imaging as part of their outcome assessment um, for patients that are discharged after surgery. Um, so for an India exam, uh, for in India, for example, um, the surgeons in three of the hospitals that we work with already conduct a live video assessment um, for patients after they leave hospital. In addition, um, they ask patients if they have any troubles to send them a photo over WhatsApp um, to uh, do a, an assessment of the wound and triage whether or not they need to come back to hospital. Um, equally, in, in Nigeria, even some areas of Rwanda, uh, people are already using uh, imaging as part of their routine clinical practice. So whilst we're talking about this as a methodological innovation, uh, around the world, actually, this is you know, already part of clinical practice in some places. Um, so for the questionnaire study, what we're doing is a, is a validation, a diagnostic test accuracy study. Uh, where patients come back to hospital as part of the trial at present, and this will be the last trial um, which we will ever do this in. Um, so patients come back to the hospital at 30 days, and in the two or three days before they come back to the hospital, a blinded researcher that will not be doing that 30-day assessment uh, calls the patient and conducts the, the wound healing questionnaire assessment. Uh, so we can directly correlate the, um, uh, the findings of the questionnaire versus that 30 day assessment. And this is the platform you'll see um, for the rest of the study within a trial that I've, I've mentioned. Uh, oh no, I created a lovely recruitment GIF for um, the, the, uh, the swap, but it's not working I'm afraid. However, we've, so we've recruited um, about 380 patients to have that uh, telephone assessment at, at present. So the study is progressing well. Um, as a result of our, of our feedback from the the focus groups and discussions with surgeons and clinicians. And uh, we've now integrated a live video wound assessment um, conducted by the research nurse or surgeon that's following up the patient, um, as well as conducting the wound healing questionnaire um, in, 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 in India. Um, and the, the ambition of this is that it as much as possible emulated the kind of assessment that you'd have if the patient comes back to, uh, comes back to clinic. Um, so we've worked with with sites and um, with expert review to come up with a, a schedule which we think will work well for patients. And we'll be testing both the feasibility of this in terms of you know who can we reach, how can we reach, what geographical areas will work. And we'll also look at whether it enhances the diagnostic accuracy of doing that um, excellent wound healing questionnaire from Rhiannon and the team alone. And um, so what we've said is that um, 
if possible, uh, before the surgeon, the patient is discharged from hospital, they will meet the person that's going to do their, their video assessment, typically the research nurse or one of the surgical trainees. Uh, they'll introduce themselves and let them know that that will be part of their 30 day remote digital assessment. Um, and then at the sort of 27 to 30 day point, um, they'll confirm verbal consent. Uh, if the patient still has a wound dressing on, they'll make sure that they have a, a, a change of dressing available. Um, at which point they'll remove the dressing and make sure that they can see all along the length of the wound. So the patient will um, either, as Rhiannon suggested, um, ask a family member or one of the community health workers to help with this, or they'll put it into selfie mode and, and show the, the surgeon themselves. And they'll do a live video assessment where there's no transfer of digital information. This can be, duct can con be conducted pragmatically on whichever ever, um, follow-up system people use locally. Um, one major advantage of this is that there's no need for transfer of imaging or data or, um, and it gets around lots of the problems that we, we may see with ethics of, uh, of video assessments and, and things like that. Uh, so we do think this may be a useful model for people to consider going forwards. Um, one of the other problems we've encountered in the UK is that if you send a, a photo of your wound to a surgeon, technically it would be part of their clinical record. So it should be attached to the clinical notes. Um, but with a live assessment, um, it allows that um, transfer of information to the surgeon uh, and interpretation, um, but without any transfer of digital data. Um, the second point is that um, we will ask the patient then to progress along the wound so that they can have a look at any areas of concern. You could even ask the patient to gently push on one area to see if you know, pus is expressed, for example, if there was an area of concern. So it gives that element of interactivity that you would get if a patient saw in clinic. Um, we've already trained our sites in the CDC criteria and how to assess wounds. So they'll be using you know, that similar criteria that we've seen already um, to do that video assessment. Um, so this is perhaps the, the novel thing that we've um, been doing, that live video assessment of the wound. So in terms of a global perspective, um, there's this great tool that's been, been created in the Blue Bar study that we're um, you know, doing an international validation of. Uh, we're using these tr efficient trial-based platforms with our, our global partners to, um, uh, to be able to do that to a really high quality, robust um, uh, degree. And we're also introducing this live uh, video wound assessment to see how it may enhance the diagnostic accuracy um, of just using the questionnaire alone. Now, I've said that um, follow-up is the major methodological problem um, for patients in low and middle income settings. Uh, but what we found now, of course, is that follow-up is, is our uh, major problem in, in the UK too. And um, because of COVID, you know, we cannot bring people ethically back to hospital to have their 30-day wound reviews. And we've been forced to do everything over the telephone or with um, you know, video or imaging systems. And so we have to adapt rapidly and we have a duty to our patients, an ethical duty um, to conduct trials to a high quality. And so in Rossini 2, um, which is an ongoing trial in the UK, uh, we've been looking at rapidly evaluating uh, digital follow up to help support the robustness of the trial. Rossini 2, I think um, some of you may have heard of before if you've been part of the excellent wound research network. And I highly recommend being part of that network if these are topics that interest you. Um, it is a, an adaptive, a multi-arm, multi-stage randomized trial of several interventions to reduce surgical site infection. So it uses a really clever design, which allows us to find which package of interventions from a, a shopping list of things are most likely to reduce surgical site infection. And this is that design. Um, so some patients don't get any different than normal practice. Some patients may get one of those iodine sticky inside drakes, which are impregnated with, with iodine to try and reduce um, contamination of the skin. Some patients will get a, a, a gentamicin impregnated sponge um, uh, added on top of the, the fascia underneath the skin, which will slowly percolate gentamicin into the surrounding tissues and try and reduce the bacterial contamination. And some patients will get a different type of skin prep, chlorhexidine, um, versus whatever the surgeons are currently using, and, and in every possible combination. Um, so this is a really exciting trial design. I really like trial designs. So if anyone's interested in talking about this afterwards, uh, uh, this is uh, Tom, Professor Tom Pentney's trial, and it's a really exciting uh, new methodology. And um, so in Rossini 2, we have the problem that we don't have that 
gold standard 30 day um, face to face CDC assessment to compare our digital follow up to. So we've had to be a bit um, innovative in what we do to compare a video assessment um, to whatever a, a clinician sees when, when they go and assess the patient. Um, so our other follow up point within the trial, other than 30 days, is that day seven or, or discharge, um, whichever comes sooner. Um, so what we've had to do is use that follow up point in order to try and validate um, a live video assessment. Um, so in a similar way to that talent study, which I showed, showed you earlier, uh, patients will be um, recruited to Rossini 2 and also give consent for video follow up. Um, and then before they leave hospital, a blinded researcher that won't be doing the discharge review and um, will ask the patient to do a video follow up while they're on the ward with us. So using their mobile phone on the ward um, and do a CDC type assessment over video, asking patients the questions they would do if they came back in person uh, and also having a look at the wound from top to bottom, as we showed according to that protocol previously. We'll have the other blinded reviewer then do the um, the seven day uh, or discharge assessment. Um, and then we'll be able to compare the diagnostic accuracy of the video um, to what was seen by the person on the ward. Uh, so it's slightly imperfect because it's not that 30 day time point. Um, and we know at least a third or so of uh, wound infections happen after people leave hospital. Um, but for us, this represents an opportunity for that study within a trial model and to do a really robust validation study. Um, and we'll also look at some of the mechanistics. I know I saw Josh was looking at some of the features that could be detected over video. And we'll be doing a, a more in-depth exploration of the kind of features that can and can't be seen over video within this study. Um, so sadly, no results to show for you for either of those yet, but hopefully some ex excitement around um, some work that we will be presenting back to this community um, in the future. Um, I think from a COVID perspective, you know, we, we all have to urgently adapt our methods for research. And hopefully we've, we've shown that there is um, some innovative models that we can use for rapid evaluation of these techniques. Um, we like this idea of live video because it gets around that transfer of information problem. Um, so we hope that that perhaps is picked up in, in other studies and be delighted to talk to anyone um, that has um, any experience with that already or would like to use that within future research. And then um, more and more within our platform of trials, we'll keep integrating these kind of methodological uh, SWOT study within a trial because we think it provides a really cool opportunity to explore more around wound, wound research. Um, so that's everything from me. Um, very many thanks to all of our collaborators around the world and um, from the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit that have been leading the Rossini 2 study. Um, and be delighted to talk to anyone that's interested more in, in these methods. Um, and look forward to reporting back shortly. Thanks very much again, Melissa, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, James. Some really, really fantastic works. And I think it's quite right that we need to ensure data collection for SSI isn't overly burdensome, either for patients or clinicians. And also in some areas, we need to consider new approaches such as live video, especially in the current climate. I also echo your sentiments, including the relative priority of SSI prevention. Yesterday, I participated in the James Lind Alliance National Research Program, and SSI priorities was one of the 10 national priorities set for cardiac surgery. So in the next section, we're going to be setting up for some questions. If you haven't already posted on the chat, please do. You can use that icon to ask questions or make comments. Uh, give us a few minutes while we welcome Josh and Rhiannon back to help answer some questions. And I think, thank you, there's Rhiannon already. Great, great welcome. And we'll just wait for Josh to return. There'll be a few short questions and then we will make sure everyone gets a comfort break as well. Josh might have found his way over to get a cappuccino or something similar. That was a great talk, James. It's really, really amazing what you've been doing so quickly as well. And um, all that work overseas is brilliant. 
So, Rhiannon, I know while we are just um, waiting for Josh to return, one of the questions coming through was about studies um, examining images in non-white skin. And this is something that's come up, as you know, with our recommendations for digital images within the National Wound Care Strategy Group. Within the strategy recommendations, Josh is joining us now. Hi, Josh. Um, within the National Wound Care Strategy Group, we are looking at recommendations around colour patches with disposable scare scales, which aren't readily available in practice, but something like Munzel colour um, charts can help detect variation in skin tone. Uh, the question comes whether these studies you've presented on have included uh, different different skin colors. Rhiannon, I'll ask you first, please. Yeah, well, um, uh, as I... I present at British, so very little variation, and that was not intentional. I mean, we, we aim to recruit a, a huge spread of all different demographics ages and, and different wound locations and also ethnicity was one of the aims but obviously in this in the sample that accepted or were approached it wasn't a, a broad representation of, at all and that's certainly we want to investigate more and we would need to um and unfortunately the study didn't do much on Sorry, Rhiannon, I'm having a bit of problem hearing you. You Scre seem to have frozen. Oh. Any yes, could you just repeat your last comment? I'm sure everyone has it and we are recording the webinar. So all sound technical difficulties will be uh, resolved there, I'm sure. But just for, for listeners now. Yeah, I, um, just to, to say it's definitely something we would want to look at more with and with much more emphasis to try and recruit a wider variety of ethnic groups because until then we, we can't tell whether the the method that I described in the selfie wound study is is generalizable so yeah thank you for your answer Josh any thoughts in terms of different skin tones and the use of digital images uh, similar to Rhiannon really uh, unfortunately uh, Hull and the East Riding North Lincolnshire area isn't the most ethnically diverse um, so the the people that were in the studies that we've done were all um, a Caucasian skin tone we it, it, it's not through any exclusion or exception it was just that that was the people that were uh, willing to be involved in the study and that were available to us as as participants um, but absolutely any future research has to include all uh, ethnicities or skin tones um, as well as things like scarring burn scarring uh, problems that or, or uh, skin conditions that may influence the quality of images that come to us Thank you. I think I think from our experience with photo at discharge, where we're routinely um, taking pictures of our patients who have undergone cardiac surgery, I have to say that this isn't a an issue that's presenting any particular challenges with. We've asked for broad feedback on the initiative, and within our local uh, patient groups, um, we've had a considerable considerable variation of um, different skin tones and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Again with a national survey conducted by the National Patients Association where we, we broadly asked the question would this be appropriate, would this help you manage your surgical wound, the overwhelming response back across the ethnicity groups was yes we would find this very helpful. So I think in practical terms um, the, you know, consent being first and foremost the most important consideration and re respecting uh, patients if they choose not to have the picture. But for those that do, to ensure that the lighting is appropriate um, and also 
just considering additional tools like the color patch, which may help set the set the colors and lightings for the image. And I'm I am primarily talking about wounds that are healing well, rather than wounds that are healing by secondary intention. Of course, the surge of, um the photo at discharge is uh, an SSI tool for patients rather than actually detecting SSIs or diagnosing SSIs. But I think the learning could be transferable. So um, the next question we have is about the challenge in the current setting. I think we're all aware there's COVID around and a question has come, uh, both Josh and Rhiannon mentioned it's difficult to get patients back to hospital to take photos. If we can effectively monitor patients remotely, would this impact on the workload for our in-hospital teams. So I guess I'll, I'll go to you, Rhiannon, first. Did your study, I don't know if you've um, looked at this, but just in terms of the, the time saving, if either for the patients, for them not having to return, or from a work stream flow for in-hospital colleagues, do you think we're, we're going to be offering some efficiencies? Um. Well, as I mentioned, so my work ultimately is in trials. So certainly from a trial perspective, when you've got potentially thousands of participants, um, yes, there's a, a massive time saving advantage. Ideally, I mean, lots of pa patients would have no problems with their wound. So coming back for that 30 day assessment, which is the, the kind of 30 day cutoff, um, SSI timing assessment. If there's no problems with the wound, then and and that's a requirement, then a remote assessment would save the patient lots of time, money, etc., and also the the trial teams as well in terms of their resources to see all of those patients. So I think I think it does, and I can't really say much about um, you know routine practice, but my I can only imagine that by having the the, sort of the images and the other remote um, methods like the Bluebell Wound Healing Questionnaire, ultimately it could act as a, like a, an alert or a flag so that only those people that really need that face-to-face -face assessment to make more treatment decisions are, are then seen. So yeah, I think it's, I can only see it as a win-win from both um, both the healthcare team and, and the patients. I mean, obviously somebody would need to look through all of the, that data that's coming in remotely. They'd have to assess the images but again I think weighing that up against um, seeing every single person face to face would probably be time saving. Thank you Josh you're in practice and have a lot of learning with the dressing trial do you think that this in practice could be a converted um, converted to a way forward for follow-up for patients? Um, yeah so, so to echo what Rhiannon said it, it one it offers a lot of efficiency in research studies and and what we found was that the patients who could come back and were well enough to come back weren't particularly the ones who needed to come back um for, for purposes of capturing infection data because the patients who get infections are more morbid and are therefore more likely to be stuck at home and unable to come into hospital one thing that COVID has done is it is it's forced clinical teams and the clinical team that I'm working in at the minute to rapidly adopt um, telehealth, video calls, online methods of conducting clinical care. And I think now one of the big things that we have to do as, as researchers and clinical researchers is sort of take all of that that's been rapidly adopted in clinical practice and work backwards from it and say, right, how can we take the bits of this that have worked and apply them to clinical trials and validate things and say, is there a robust methodology that we can take from this? And is this acceptable? And within the confines of COVID, it was acceptable, but can we then, when we come out of the other side of it, take it and use it to um, enhance routine clinical care and enhance clinical trials to get better results on both counts. And I think that's going to be the key is not necessarily will it give us efficiency, it's 
has what we've done so far worked and can we do it safely and effectively in the future? I think I think this is it. So would you know of uh, examples in practice where patients are being asked to submit their PHE surveillance data, let's say, or um, otherwise via an app routine lace? Um, I, not that specifically. The the experience that I have at the minute, so we, like I said, I'm a plastic and hand surgeon um, and we run a hand trauma service that covers pretty much the same area that I showed earlier. So it, it covers the entirety of Humberside, Northern Lincolnshire and into North Yorkshire. So it's a massive geographical area. Um, and previously, if patients had a traumatic hand injury, they would be referred into a clinic that was in Hull and they would be seen the next day. And that involved travel and coming yeah. to a new hospital. With COVID, we moved to those referrals coming online. So they were done via WhatsApp. Um, and we were able to video review patients who were sat in some, in a tertiary, sorry, they were sat in a spoke and we were the hub um, with a nurse practitioner or any doctor or whatever. Um, we conducted a video consultation with them and we were able to do examinations over the, over teleconference um, and make a management plan based on that that avoided that travel. If they then needed to come to us as a tertiary centre, they did, but actually we avoided quite a lot of inward referrals that wasn't necessarily needed. So that's the experience that I have of it. I'm not entirely certain about submitting public health surveillance data or, or post-discharge follow-up. But the experience that I have is is one of efficiency savings in that fashion. Thank you. Just, the other thing to add, oh, sorry, Melissa. Okay. The other thing to add just before we move on to a different topic, because of course, if these methods are used in real time, then potentially things can be dealt with a lot quicker. So ultimately, nipping problems in the bud before they then get worse, and of course, that's you know that's massively efficient from all, from everyone, all stakeholders perspectives and the patients I spoke to liked that fact that it was the kind of it's a, a reassurance method as well you know if, if you think you've got a problem you can act on it quite quickly before it gets worse. I think you made a great point earlier who is going to review all these images and certainly experiences coming out of the US is in theory the the receipt of um, wound images is terrific, gives the patient sort of that immediate um, feedback, or at least they would hope to have that. But in reality, as you again mentioned, th th there's a substantial number of patients who would be sending in images. And what we don't want to do is have daily images submitted with the expectation that somebody was actually going to come in and, and feed back. Mm -hmm. I, Josh, can I just ask you about the um, the virtual MDTs because I think it's quite timely in this in these days. Did you um, review using video links? You mentioned WhatsApp. Did you also request um, images or like still images, standalone images? Uh, yeah. So we so the it, again, it's it's one experience, one service experience. We have a baton telephone that's uh, trust approved stays on site, so it passes information governance and images can be sent to that bat on telephone to the on-call clinician um, from the from the spokes. So they are taken again by a health professional um, and sent to that and can be reviewed by the on-call clinician. Uh, so I think um, just looking at the, the chat stream, I think we, if it's okay, um, and there are no further questions, we'll take a short break at this stage so that we give our terrific speakers a bit of a, a break as well. And we're returning at 11, if that's all right. So I will wrap up. Thank you both, Rhiannon and, and Josh, for joining us with your expertise. You. Fantastic to have you. And is it all right at the end of the um, webinar? We'll be suggesting that if people have direct questions and didn't catch your contact details from your last slides, that they can get in touch with us and we'll make sure that we get you linked up. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. And happy to share slides as well if, if people want that as well. 
Perfect. Thank you for the offer and both for your time this morning. And I'd like to thank everyone who are currently online and ask that everybody returns after a quick comfort break at 11. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, for this second half of our webinar using digital images for surgical site infection surveillance. I'm delighted now to welcome Ria Betteridge, who has presented on numerous occasions with us with the Cardiac SSI Network, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing the presentation. Welcome, Ria. Thank you. Um, can I see my slides? Lovely. Thank you. Um, do I control? Oh, sorry, I'll work out if I can control them from here. I'm sure I, oh, I can. I can see it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Ria Betteridge. I'm a nurse consultant in tissue viability at the Oxford University Hospitals. Um, I'm also a doctoral student as well at the moment. So what I'm going to do a report on here is the. Um, it was a, a study within a trial um, from the WIST trial. So I won't focus too much on the WIST trial itself, but actually what our um, what we what we did as part of the study which is around the validation um, and observation of uh, wound, uh, wound pictures wound images so this presentation was actually presented at the tissue viability society back in 2019 i haven't altered the slides so some of them i'll skip over because um, my counterpart is marta um, isn't with me they i've been given permission though to use the full slide deck for this so if you bear with me so the WIST trial, um, the background to it, it was um, a major trauma trial. We're looking at high risk of infection and also the type of dressing. So it was um, an RCT. Um, it was a pragmatic RCT, multi-centred. Um, so uh, 24 of the major trauma hospitals around the UK. Um, we were looking at the intervention of uh, the use of negative pressure wound therapy as incisional support versus standard dressings. The primary outcome being deep surgical site infection using the CDC criteria within 30 days post-operatively. So the pre this presentation today will just describe the protocol that we use for the assessment of the post-operative post assessment of the uh, wound images. Um, and describe the experiences really, I think, from a clinical point of view of using assessment, um, using images for clinical assessment. So the two people involved in the um, assessment of the images was myself and one of my senior team. Um, and we're from an orthopedics and trauma background as well. So I'll just give you some context to our position in this as well. So we looked at um, whether clinical photography or wound photography was a, any added anything additional to um, more detailed clinical data that was collected as part of the trial itself. Um, and to also look at the, um, to examine the level of agreement between the clinical data and the wound assessment photograph data. So just for quick methods, um, four to six week follow up appointment was arranged. Um, clinical data was collected by with the local research nurses um, with descriptors of um, the wound. And they also took photographs at the same time so that these photographs were then um, uploaded for us to review. The um, we look for two things on the images. We look for surgical site infection or evidence of surgical site infection and also um, wound healing. We, we work with definitions um, for this where we had to go through, we went through a pilot and then redefined the definitions based on um, some criteria, but I'll explain those further along in, the, in, this, in this section. So I'll just point out we were independent of the core trial itself. So we we weren't part of the um, the full trial team. So we looked at so what we were given originally was whether to when looking at the images, whether we deemed them to be not infected or infected um, with some key characteristics that we were given as part of that. And we could do optional criteria. 
and for wound assessment, um, whether the edges were closed. If it had a small scab on the line, it was classed as healed. And if it was a scab with erythema, we were, we were to put it down as non-healed. Um, redness around the wound also was a potential SSI outcome. If there was going to be, so we had a criteria as well. So if the um, we couldn't agree between the two assessors, so um, my colleague and I, we assessed them independently. We didn't sit together and um, assess the wounds. There were over a thousand images that we assessed as part of this trial. And I'm happy to discuss how long that took us um, when we look at how long it takes to review an image, because I think the previous sessions, I think that's actually brought up in within those, those discussions. Um, and then if we couldn't, and then we, so we sat together if we, when we didn't agree, and then if we didn't agree, the two of us, then we would have got a third independent healthcare professional to um, adjudicate. So in total, there were 1,123 participants, that's 72.6% of all participants. Um, and the reasons that the, the number isn't than the total number is, um, was mainly due to, um, either people not attending follow-up for the images to be taken or patients who declined to have their photographs um, used for as part of the trial. There were some poor quality images that we disregarded, um, photographs that were out of image um, or ones where it was unclear which, which wounds we, we were actually assessing because some of them the patients had three or four different wounds, so that made it a little bit more difficult. So we assessed 1,108 images um, for SSI and 1,113 for wound healing. So this was the inter individual agreement for SSI between myself and my colleague. And between us um, independently assessing these wounds for SSI, we um, came to 89% agreement, which was is pretty impressive. Things that um, were, became a little bit more difficult for us is distant photographs. Um, and when you blow them up, they become um, pixelated and not very easy to, to deal with. Um, and there's also small scabs on the, pro on the proximal line um, look suspicious, having both worked in um, trauma orthopedics, I think, the, assessing something at four weeks isn't always going to give us the outcome that we were looking at at that time. Um, again, more small scabs along the incisional line. Is that healed? Is that not healed? Um, then looking at the inter-individual agreement for the characteristics we looked at. Um, and again, I think that it was difficult because we, we weren't asked to um, rate in priority the images. So we had we could choose multi-select um, options for why the characteristics we assumed that we, we had assessed as being SSI characteristics, but we weren't asked to um, rank them. So I think that made would have made a difference in this case, which is why there is only twenty seven percent agreement. But actually, overall, the outcome was still pretty good. Um, then we looked also at the um, image. So the issues that we had, there's, it's very challenging to um, identify infection from a photograph. I think, as one of the previous presenters said, video imaging is sometimes easier and there are issues related to skin tone, which again, I think has been brought up nationally as well as within the previous sessions. Um, erythema is particularly difficult to see in darker pigmented skin tones. Um, assessing two dimensional images can be really quite testing because um, most of us like to actually touch wounds to have a look, see what's actually going on and seeing patients reaction and response to that. Um, and determining the um, different types of surgical site infection as well. We weren't asked to look at deep organ space, because, deep wounds, because organ space isn't actually a, an indicator in orthopaedic and trauma patients. So when we look at then into individual agreement for wound healing, again, it was 87%, which is again, pretty, pretty good. So things that we were asked to assess, the clips are in still in, in place. We can't assess that as being wound healed. The, the clips are still there. Um, small scabs on the incisional line, is that healed or not completely healed? And so the second assessment, the final outcome, 
overall, um, we found that we assessed 12% as being infected, 88% being non-infected. And wound healing, 15% not healed, 85% healed. So overall, how did this work with our, um, our case report forms? Um, so 88% agreement between what was on the case report forms and um, our um, assessments. 82% agreement on wound healing between the image assessments and the clinician. And again, with the patients, it was 80%. So these are pretty, pretty good. And I think if you know, we have better um, measures and definitions for patients, I think this would make a real difference. So really the discussion piece, which I think from a clinical point of view is, is um, the bit that really, so looking back and reflecting on this, the, basically, there's really many aspects that relate to post-operative wounds, um, including the type of closure used um, and the quality of achieved wound closure is quite difficult in trauma patients. Um, looking at both acute and long-term care after surgery. Um, so some wounds, we look, we use this 30-day um, definer, but we have metal work in there. Um, there could be all sorts of reasons why we should be looking beyond that. One of the issues we found is the, the um, plethora of definitions for wound healing, wound healed, um, was quite interesting, which is why we had to come up with our own um, agreed protocol for what we would define as wound healed or wound healing. Um, and the time of collection of the Im images changed with some of them, some were, were done within four weeks, some were six weeks, which may have changed the outcome as well. I think what we were pleased at is that most of them had successfully um, healed at four to six weeks. So the conclusion is the diagnosing, you know, diagnosing wound infection and healing using images um, alone should be undertaken with caution. Um, I think this is where a conversation with patients is really important. And I do like the idea of video um, assessment as well. We need clear definitions and criteria um, to be able to consistently diagnose wound infection and healing um, and to guide clinical trials in the future. And again, I think for this, I'd also like to thank the rest of um, the team. So Julie Brown, my, my colleague, um, it was Prof Matt Costa's um, study and Julie Bruce, the WIS team themselves and obviously NMI HR. Thank you. Ria, thank you very much for presenting and very lots of sort of reflections to take away from your study. I hope that it's drier in your neck of the woods than it is in mine. Thank you very much <laughs> for your time. And I look forward now to welcoming Kenny McLean, who is presenting today on findings from the TWIST study. Welcome, Kenny. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm a clinical research fellow based up in the University of Edinburgh um, and this is uh, a clinical trial that we've conducted up here uh, across two of our uh, tertiary sites um, and sort of looking to try to, to explore whether or not there is a, a sort of clinical efficacy in the use of this tool uh, in, of a smartphone tool in terms of uh, uh, sort of helping with diagnosis of SSI. So again, probably preaching to the crowd, um, surgical site infections are very common in general surgery, um, can be up to 25% in uh, emergency surgery cases, but uh, often the range of sort of 2 to 10%. Uh, and I mean, I, and as we probably all know here, increasingly these occur post-discharge, um, uh, and, and so is often not sort of seen by surgical teams and dealt with in the community uh, and are often ones that are, uh, you know, obviously some do need surgical intervention, but for the most part, this can perhaps be dealt with uh, by antibiotics, close monitoring and, and so on. Um, so ideally, just in terms of, I guess, pathways that we want, might want patients to kind of follow down uh, is that if there's sort of no issues uh, with their, their wounds, then uh, we generally want just standard follow-up. Um, occasionally, patients will have concerns with their wounds, even if there's not perhaps presence of SSI, there's plenty of other things that can uh, happen with wounds. Uh, so in that case, is uh, perhaps going to community services for that. Um, 
uh, for what might be classed as minor uh, superficial SSI. Uh, we perhaps you know want those to be seen by community services. Uh, perhaps patients might not be able to access that particularly at the moment. So uh, whether or not they would uh, go to sort of more emergency care to then go back to community services uh, with a bit more um, input. Uh, and then for perhaps more major SSI, which might require uh, emergency care, IV antibiotics, operative intervention, and so on, um, we ideally want them to go straight to uh, where they can receive that care, uh, so hospital or, or surgical teams. Uh, and uh, perhaps you know patients may end up going to their GP first of all, who then refer them on. Uh, but ideally, you'd want them to go sort of directly to where uh, they need to go. So again, probably preaching to the choir. There's uh, you know huge scope for telemedicine. Uh, there's uh, I think the most recent estimate was something about eighty percent of uh, adults in the UK currently have access to smartphone technology, uh, and a third use it as their sort of primary device to connect them to the internet. So um, obviously, huge scope to to use this for uh, not just I guess within trials, but for sort of routine care, uh, integrating sort of digital health into into post-operative care. So, as I say, th this uh, clinical trial uh, is basically looking at trying to see whether a smartphone delivered tool can help with assessment of surgical site infection and ideally result in some sort of earlier treatment or earlier diagnosis. Uh, and it was a, a trial aimed to recruit uh, 500 patients across two tertiary hospitals uh, across Edinburgh. Um, so that uh, started in 2016 and it uh, finished just before COVID started, fortunately. Uh, so uh, we're very fortunate in that. Uh, so the kind of broad overview of it is it's a one-to-one -one randomization uh, with half the patients going towards the intervention arm where uh, they received the smartphone delivered uh, wound questionnaire. So just some very basic proms uh, based around the uh, uh, CDC criteria and uh, also have an opportunity to upload uh, images as well. And similar to one of the previous presentations, we used the REDCap pl platform for that. Um, and patients throughout the 30 day period would have access to that uh, tool where they could complete it basically at any point they had concerns with their wounds, uh, but also with uh, some routine follow-up being asked at uh, days 3, 7 and 15, just to make sure that people are ideally using the tool and, and uh, not just uh, not recognising concerns with their own wounds and then letting it uh, develop further. Uh, and uh, the alternative was just standard post-operative care, so uh, no other difference from usual. And uh, both groups received tele telephone follow-up at 30 days. Uh, along with a patient experience questionnaire. So uh, the intervention itself, just to give a wee bit more information. So they would uh, submit their, their prom information, they would submit their uh, wound image, and that would be reviewed by a clinician, so a, a sort of senior surgeon, consultant surgeon, and uh, they would classify this according to three stages of risk, just less about trying to diagnose the SSI perhaps by the image or, or problems alone, but just trying to risk stratify it so they go to it where it would be most appropriate for diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so if it was deemed to be low risk, no obvious evidence of SSI, uh, that would just be termed as uh, being normal wound healing um, with some safety netting around if they still had concerns uh, around the wounds to go to the GP or, or appropriate access, uh, access appropriate services. Uh, medium risk would be suggesting that there's a possibility of a surgical site infection, so they should perhaps go to their uh, GP services. And ones where there's a probable or, or high risk of a surgical site infection, that they should return to their treatment centre uh, or contact the uh, emergency surgery uh, staff uh, locally. Uh, and in the background, we had some uh, machine learning stuff that we were kind of working on, but that was sort of completely separate to, to patient care. Uh, so primary outcome was time to diagnosis of the surgical site infection CDC criteria, and we were determining that via uh, sort of the normal electronic patient record, uh, GP records, and 
uh, the uh, sort of 30 phone call follow-up for the patient and also looking at service usage and the patient experience as well. Uh, so all very provisional just because with COVID things have follow-ups been, been a bit slower than we'd expected but uh, we're hopefully at a recent stage that we'll, we'll finalise the data set. Um, so we had 492 patients recruited uh, with uh, just about 8% uh, SSI across the two different arms. Uh, and in terms of did it actually reduce the time to diagnosis of the wound infections? Uh, so uh, short answer is no statistically significant difference, uh, though probably the trial in retrospect was underpowered in terms of uh, the expectation of the standard deviation, so the variation in uh, the, the time to development of the, the SSIs was a lot wider than we were kind of expecting for that. So there does seem to be some evidence, I mean, not, not statistically significant, that smartphones are perhaps, uh, that, that group is perhaps being diagnosed a wee bit earlier, but not statistically significant and, and certainly not in terms of the, the primary outcome uh, for that. Uh, when we did a sort of time to event uh, Captain Meyer plot, uh, this was showing that, uh, again, ac across the sort of time frame that the study was happening, no significant difference between these two groups in the time to diagnosis for that. Uh, but when we looked at the service usage, uh, there did appear to be a significantly lower rate of GP attendance in those with the smartphone group. Um, so just 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 over uh, half of the patients uh, there and uh, but when it came to a &E attendance uh, no significant difference between the groups but again smartphone non-significantly lower than that uh, so perhaps some cautious evidence with the at least the, the GP attendance that it was perhaps uh, reducing that there uh, re reducing people going to the GP uh, when we looked at the patient experience, uh, we gave some questions that were the same to both the uh, smartphone group and the control group. And when these were compared, uh, generally there was a more positive response uh, in the smartphone group across the board, uh, with in general uh, less time to uh, get advice about their wound. Uh, finding it easier to get hold of uh, uh, advice about their wound and finding the advice given was in some way useful. Um, so that is all uh, good evidence that, that I, I suppose patients uh, do appreciate these kind of things and I suppose backs up the, the evidence that's already been presented today. Uh, and when we went to look at the questions that have just been asked to the smartphone group in terms of the actual use of the tool, Again, very largely positive uh, experience from that intervention, uh, though the thing that perhaps seemed to stand out was that uh, there was a, a sort of a significant minority of people who found uh, uploading the image uh, perhaps difficult. And I, I suppose that perhaps reflects the fact that the REDCap system that we use is not necessarily built for patients. It's built for research purposes and, and probably researchers and, and clinicians and, and so on. Um, so perhaps not the most easy, most user accessible tool to, to use sometimes. Uh, so that was kind of interesting from that point of view. Um, challenges that we came across. So quality of the images is certainly one that's been kind of spoken about uh, at length today. And I think there's some really interesting interventions that, that could be placed there. Uh, we tried to take a fairly pragmatic point of view with this in giving some advice but fairly minimal and, and seeing I guess how people uh, got along with that. Um, for the most part I think no necessarily uh, major issues with it though there were some uh, people that had to have messages to, to sort of clarify can you retake that uh, image um, and I suppose it's designing a way that is going to minimise the burden to patients and the expertise required to upload the most perfect image with what is deliverable and, and easy for them to, to do. Um, 
In terms of uptake of the smartphone tool use, about two thirds of patients um, used it as per protocol, so gave us the routine images, uh, about a third that didn't, and I thought that was interesting, uh, again, with the previous presentation, the, the selfie study, um, that there was similar reflection that, that not everyone was using it, and it'd be, it was really interesting to hear about some of the reasons why. Uh, that's certainly something that we didn't precisely look at here, but I think is, is extremely relevant. Uh, and then, as has been spoken about before as well, which is uh, always nice that we're all experiencing the same issues. Uh, in terms of the burden to service, in terms of if we were to deliver something like this with day three, seven, fifteen uh, wound images, that's a large number of images that we're delivering that across the service. So, how do we make it uh, something that is actually deliverable uh, and, and scalable uh, if we were to do that? Uh, so, some further work that we're aiming to sort of look at with this is um, trying to take a sort of imp implementational science point of view and understand how the tool itself could be improved, how a digital post op surveillance could be best integrated into routine practice, um, looking at machine learning and whether or not uh, machine learning with the, the proms or the uh, wound images themselves could be used to help perform this form of risk stratification instead of having a clinician or a, a nurse or other healthcare professional um, involved in that. Uh, and also there's a huge number of other applications we've focused, uh, focused on uh, abdominal surgery just because we're uh, that's our background, but there's obviously a huge amount of other surgical specialties and, and other types of wounds that would be uh, of interest to explore this in. Uh, yeah, and just uh, thanks to all the, the patients and the staff who've been supporting, and then the uh, TWIST team as well. Thank you very much. Kelly, thank you for that fab presentation. Um, again, I'd like to remind colleagues who are on the webinar that they can leave comments via the chat, and we'll make sure um, to link you up after this webinar. So if you have a question that's directed at any of our speakers in particular, please post it on the right hand side via the chat uh, with your name and email details. And we'll make sure that we follow up and, and link up the uh, relevant colleagues. So now to our last session of the day, last but not least, uh, I'm delighted to welcome James from Isla Care. Uh, we're very much looking forward to the presentation on using machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to improve the quality of images. Thank you, James. Fantastic. Thank you, Melissa. Just sharing my slides. So uh, it's good to good to be here. Uh, I'm James. Unlike everyone uh, else that's been presenting this morning, I'm I'm not from a clinical background. I'm a, a software engineer, and been working with the NHS for a number of years uh, in different roles, um, kind of in operations and most recently uh, in tech as uh, as part of Isla. Isla is um, a company that I co-founded last year, um, bringing uh, allowing anyone involved with with a patient's care to uh, securely and seamlessly add visual data against that that patient's record be it photos or, or videos we're currently working with a number of hospitals um in different use cases from right from community care um for um tissue viability teams through to outpatients um, and allowing in, in one example um patients to submit videos of, of seizures but we've been working um very closely with the royal brompton um and this um this use case of surgical site surveillance and I'm going to be talking you through one of the the challenges that we've we've faced um, as a result of that work um, as, as kind of a prerequisite to that we've built up um, an SSI app essentially to, to help them um, as we've heard a number of times this morning collect information from patients at home and um, so that patients don't have to be visiting the hospital and um, and that's been based on work from the Bluebell study group which makes it suitable for national surveillance participation uh, for Public Health England. So to jump into to one of those challenges um, um, the like we've said, um, images are increasingly seen as a key component of wound surveillance. Uh, we've heard that again and again this morning because it gives us so much additional context to the, the problem that we're looking at. 
Um, but one of the challenges specifically that the Royal Brompton was facing was that a lot of those images that were being captured, almost 10% in, in some areas, were too blurry to make a decision um, off the back of. Um, and, and that becomes very important because not only um, does that then increase a lot of the kind of operational overhead in terms of asking patients to resubmit photos, um, but it also then delays um, decision making if we if we can't make a decision based on the a photo that's been submitted. And there's a number of approaches to, to solve that problem. Um, so just jumping into to kind of the the headline of the the study, we 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 landed on on AI as a solution. Um, I'm I'm often fearful about talking about AI and, and machine learning because it is a bit of a buzz buzzword. We did um, go through a number of different options before we landed on on that as a a way of um, delivering the the change that we wanted to make. Um, so why can't we just look at the number of pixels or the size of the image file? We, we, we did look at this as an option and um, we found that um, unfortunately even pictures taken in kind of low um, fidelity cameras could actually be quite clear in nature so we could make decisions even if there weren't super high number of pixels associated with the, the um, camera that's used to take the picture and then we could just check them manually but uh, like I said there's a, a big kind of operational cost of, of letting a, a patient submit a, a photo then allowing it to be re reviewed um, manually which obviously takes time and, and there's a delay there and then we need to go back to that patient and ask them to resubmit and and all of that incurs a, a delay in the, the decision making and, and couldn't we just use existing models that were out there already um, well actually a lot of those those models kind of do are based on machine learning and we did we did look at a number of those models in terms of um to to kind of evaluate what was on the market already to, to actually kind of base our research off um, and to, to learn from some of the, the lessons of, of similar people that solving uh, a similar problem elsewhere. And so um, machine learning kind of came to mind as a, as a kind of way of solving this problem. And so I just wanted to kind of take a step back and just for a lot of people on the call who are, are clinical, you might not be too close to, to these kind of, kind of buzzwords that we hear. So I, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction on on kind of what machine learning is from the, the offset. I've been using machine learning and AI almost interchangeably. And so um, just to be very clear, machine learning is a, is a subset of AI. And we've been, um, we've been using a supervised model of machine learning to where we're kind of very explicitly training a model on, on what to do. So um, let's just go through that and, and what that actually means. So the first thing that we do would be to, to choose a, a number of categories or segmentations as we call them. We then collect some, some data into those segmentations and, and put them into those groups. Um, and then we'd train a computer model to, to classify any new entries in, into one of those groups. And then we'd test it with, with a number of, of cases. So in this case, in this example, you can see a number of red circles and balls on the left-hand side and a number of green blocks on the right-hand side. And I hope, um, hope um, this isn't uh, too obvious, but then let's just start to see what happens. So we we can start to use this in a, as an example of a of a test of a trained model, and then we can pass into that model this kind of green block shape. Now, I I would assume for everyone on the call um, that um, we would we would kind of rightly assume that this would be pushed to the right into category two, um, given it very much fits with that classification. It's green uh, and it's a block. But things get a little bit more, more, um, and not only that, we're, we're really confident that um, that it would be into this category, so we'll put it right on the on the right hand side there. But things get a little bit more interesting if we start to think about some some other scenarios. So here we've got a a red block. So on the one hand, it it's red, so it, it should go to the left. But on the other, um, it's a block, so it should go on the right. And this is this is where um, things get a little bit more complex in the way that we can design these models because we need to add uh, different weightings to certain attributes of um, of any be it image or data set that we're inputting into the model. And so, actually, for the case of this example, let's say that we've weighted the the shape of the the image far more heavily than we have the color. And so, in this scenario, the the model would almost ignore the fact that the the block is red and say, "Well, this is a block." 
um, and it's a square shape. So actually, I, I think it should land on the on the right hand side. And I'm pretty confident about that decision. So let's put in a last example of a little um, picture of an elephant. Um, and so this kind of doesn't really fit with any of our, our classifications. And so um, what we would expect from, from this kind of training set is that that model might say, well, there are curves on it, although it's not a, a proper sphere or a ball. So I'm, I'm going to put it in the first category, um, but I'm not very confident about that decision. And we start to get that, that notion of a, of a kind of score coming out of, um, of the model. So that, that hopefully kind of is, is a relatively um, kind of simplified, well, very simplified version of, of what's going on. And now let's apply that to our uh, blur detection problem. So, so here we, what we're aiming for really is to, to take a number of uh, images um, of, of wounds, uh, in this case, cardiac wounds, um, and we want to be classifying one group into a clear set and one set into a, a blurry set. And then in a, in a similar fashion, we want to, once we've got a model that is, is trained to, to make that decision, we, we then will we'll test it with a number of cases and see how effectively it can classify um, the, the clear um, wound on the left, which we can make a, a kind of clinical decision off versus the, the more blurry version on the right, um, which are real examples where um, it, it becomes very difficult to make a, a clinical decision from. So, in, in order to, to get to that point and to complete that objective, there are a number of steps that we need to, to go through. So the first thing that we, we would do is we'd review the, the available data. And, and usually you'd use kind of two separate sets of data here. You'd have a, a test set and a, and a training set. And each of those would be categorized into a clear set and a blurred set. We, we collected those two sets and we, like I said, looked through some of the existing documentation available. We then take those those um, the training set of uh, clear and blurry images, and we we train a model, and and one of the parameters that we were using to really focus on was um, looking at the um, looking at any contours in the image, which would really start to allow that model to kind of split out the the clear images from the from the blurry ones. And another thing that we did was was look specifically in the, the center of the image because um, in our testing, as we iterated through, we saw a few examples or quite a few examples where the, the image of the, the wound was quite clear, but there was blur in the background. And so um, our model was, was seeing that blur and thinking that it, it should be rejected. Once we train that model, we then uh, test it. And so as part of our collaboration with the, the Royal Brompton, they were able to provide 266 images total, which were um, like those two that we saw on the, a couple of, uh, the previous slide, um, which we could use to, to test our, our training set. And this was really important because, because for, for the kinds of models that we're talking about, we need to have quite high volumes of, of training data. And so we actually use non-wound images for, for training. We used publicly available data sets of clear and blurry images to, to train our model. And then we tested the model on the images provided in those two classes from the Royal Rompton. And, and then obviously after that point, once we've tested it, we then want to iterate that, um, that process we go through to make sure that we're, we're kind of training our, our model to be as accurate and as fast as possible. And so let's jump into the results that we saw. Here we can see um, a graph showing the results. Uh, and so just to talk through what we're, we're looking at. The first thing to mention is that our, our model gives, rather than a blur score, it actually gives a, a clarity score. So the further we go to the right is, is the more clear our, 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 image, uh, our images are. And each image that we would, each of our test set that we put into the model would give us a, a, a score. And um, where a 200 might be super clear, I can definitely make a decision, or I, I definitely think this is a clear image. And a score of five might be, uh, this is a, a really blurry image and I, I think it's um, it should be rejected. Um, so we we tested the algorithm, like I said, with, with two data sets that the Royal Brompton was able to provide, a clear set and a, um, and a blurry set. Um, the blurry images on this example is the green line, and I'll come to that in a second, and the clear images are the red line. 
So we can imagine that for each score, we can look at the percentage from that category that get rejected. Uh, and obviously we want to be rejecting the, the blurry example, the, the, the blurry images, and we want to be accepting the clear examples, which is why the, the colors might be in, inverted on this example. Um, and, and obviously we want to be rejecting as many blurry examples as possible whilst maintaining as many clear ones. So we can then decide at what point we, we start rejecting them. Um, and uh, the higher that we set the number, the more we, we will reject, but we'll reject more, more clear ones. There's obviously a, a balance to be set there. What we did in practice was set a, an operating point, as it's called, at a score of, of 10. And so we can start to look at our performance specifically at that point. Oh, I've gone too far. So at that score of, of 10, we can see that we are correctly um, rejecting 62% of those, those blurry images. But that comes at a cost and that cost is um, rejecting or the, the algorithm rejecting 5% of those clear images. And you can see on this slide how the, the sample that the Royal Brompton was able to provide um, breaks down as the, the clear images and blurred images that were provided as the two kind of rows on this table. And then the results for those um, for those two categories as the, the columns. And so with this um, with this performance, and um, we agreed with the with the trust that that it was kind of working at, a, at an acceptable point to be able to to move it into um, production and see how we can implement it to to start adding value and um, be implemented for the teams. The things that we need to consider here are firstly how to make the user experience as, as seamless as possible for patients um, and also how to make the, the process as a whole as, as kind of efficient as possible for the um, for the teams that would be using it. So the, just a bit of, of background to, to um, before we get into kind of how we implemented it is just a little bit about the Isla platform itself that we we're implementing it into. Like I said, the platform allows anyone involved with a patient's care to submit and review that visual data. So you can see on the example here, a number of pictures of a hand that have been submitted. And I can be um, either on the desktop or on my, my phone, um, loading in or, or capturing live a, uh, a photo. And so in this example, we can be um, uploading a, a blurred image. So I've just um, taken that blurred image from the um, from the example I gave a few slides earlier um, on the the blurry category and when I upload that that image the Isla system will then um, take it and ping it against our our algorithm and our algorithm will um, wait for the the score to come back um, against that that operating point of 10 that we'd set and and that will usually take kind of three four four seconds to happen and once that has happened, if the, the score comes back as being below the, the threshold that we've set, then the user will get a, a little pop up on their, their screen, be it either on, on their desktop, more likely on their phone, um, to say there's blur detected in this image. Um, would you like to take it again? Uh, and there's a couple of things that were really important to us at this point. Um, the first is that um, we get a fast response for, for patients. So um, like I said, it just takes a few seconds to, to come back. But the, the other thing that we were aware of was that um, was that we, we would be rejecting or at least flagging um, some of those clear images. So we wanted to give patients the opportunity to, to actually submit anyway, as you can see on the, the left hand side there. Um, so that if they are in that 5% and they have taken a clear image, um, then we don't force them to retake and kind of um, interrupt their, their user journey in, in much of a destructive way. In terms of, of kind of next steps and, and where we and what the impact of this was, uh, we're still evaluating the, the impact just as we start to kind of ramp up in our um, collaboration with the Royal Brompton. And so we don't have any concrete numbers to show, but the um, the early signs are really positive that we'll, we'll see a reduction in um, the number of, of blurry images that are coming through to the trust and, and being evaluated by SSI teams. Um, and, and I think that's, that's kind of 
one one thing that we're we're eagerly waiting for and then alongside that we're obviously exploring ways of how we can refine that model refine the implementation to to make the, the model more accurate and the implementation be as, as seamless as possible for for the patients going through that that process and so hopefully that gives you a bit of a summary of um the work that we've been doing and how we've um used um a little bit of of machine learning to to start to resolve one of the problems that's presenting itself as uh, visual data is incorporated more and more into um, into surgical site surveillance. And I'll end there. If anyone's got any questions, um, obviously pop something in the chat or you can reach out to us directly. Thank you, James. That was a great presentation, just giving us an overview of machine learning and AI. As well, thank you to all of our speakers today, Josh Toddy, Rihanna Maysfield, James Glasby, Rhea Betteridge, Kenny McLean, as well as James from Isla Care. So we're wrapping up a few minutes early today, but I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending. If you're interested in following up with any of the presenters or on any of the topics, please send your name and details via the chat on the right hand side. We'll make sure to follow up with everyone. Finally, I'd also like to mention um, the recommendations for the use of digital images in wound care from the National Strategy. Uh, National Wound Care Strategy Program. We will be sending the recommendations out for uh, stakeholder consultation. If you haven't done so already, it's a great time to get involved with the National Wound Care Strategy Program. Register on their uh, website to find out more and to receive a copy of those draft recommendations to get your comments in. Finally, a big thank you from everyone at the Cardiac SSI Network. This is our first webinar, steep learning curve for all involved and a very ambitious program to have a lineup of such fantastic speakers. So thanks to everyone for attending and we look forward to our next um, meeting, which I hope we'll be hosting in December. Uh, more details to follow with our Twitter account. So again, Thank you. A few finishing 10 some minutes early, but take this opportunity to get in touch via the chat and we will make sure that your questions or your contacts are delivered appropriately. So thanks to everyone and we'll see you in December. Catch up soon. Thanks.